go. Hello, uh, my name is Kevin Wall. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I first need to make the you know, legal disclaimer that I'm not speaking for my company, and you'll see some problems. Maybe the OWASP in here, I'm not speaking for them either. Um, the other thing is that my clear up is that uh, this is, um, when I talk about common developer mistakes, these are common in terms of what I have personally seen in the last eight years and 250 plus projects, um, you know, from small to like, you know, 20,000 lines of code to like 8 million lines of code, things um, on two across two different companies, basically done with design review, secure design reviews and, and mostly code inspections. Right, so I see a lot of stuff because it's about to close off. So the other thing is they always tell you that you should you know start your uh, presentation with a joke, and, and that's not supposed to be the joke there. Um, the um, seriously, the you know, obligatory thing. The one thing you might want to write down is um, the GitHub thing. Um, I would put if you, if you're interested, I'm going to put my the presentation repository on my GitHub, um, and I'll post the talk there. I didn't see, unless you got a place to put them somewhere. Um, uh, see. But yeah, speaking of jokes, um, I was going to basically start with a good cryptography joke, but unfortunately, all the good cryptography jokes are indistinguishable from random noise. So. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So the things that I'm going to cover here, basically, is the stuff that's on the slides. When you get down to the miscellaneous topics, one of the things I would encourage you to do is basically, if you have a question, to ask a question. Don't, and, and you may have to wave your hand or whatever, but um, I don't want somebody to get here in the headlights look and just be totally lost. Some of this can be a little bit technical. Um, so sometimes I don't get at all to the time permitting section or whatever. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, there's good news and bad news. There's one is that developers, haven't I've seen for probably like 12 years actually implement their own algorithms, or not implement, but write their own algorithms. Um, and it's also pretty rare, like maybe three or four times in the last eight years, I've actually seen people implement their own like, um, algorithms. Partly um, I attribute that because we have like things like Java cryptography, you know, extensions, and, and the Microsoft.NET framework includes some good crypto libraries and stuff like that. So that's, that's a positive thing. Um, the bad news is that most of the developer expertise basically is coming from copy and paste and stack overflow. And, you know, I mean, that's not a, necessarily a bad way to, um, you know, get code and stuff, but the problem is a lot of times it's the, you know, ignorant, sharing ignorance. So, I mean, it wouldn't be so bad if they actually were looking on the cryptography stack overflow part, but usually it's just, you know, the general one. So, um, there's a lot of confusion between, especially on Stack Overflow, about what the difference is between confidentiality and authenticity, sometimes for good data and um, We have a confusion of basically what cipher modes are, which ones should be used, um, what pattern schemes should be used, and stuff like that. There's also a lot of still, I see a lot of broken um, crypto and legacy applications, like, you know, people still using RC4, or people using DEVs. Sometimes it, it's necessary, you know, but there's certain things that you can do to make it a little bit better. Um, and then the other thing is that even experts get things wrong. Like OpenSSL will have um, cryptographers basically contribute source code to it, right? But if you go back and look at this history, since 1999, according to the CVE details, right, it's had 194 different CVEs against it, right, which sounds shocking. So you'd think, okay, if that's done by experts, then how is the rest of the people going to, you know, uh, fare? So this is kind of like, you know, hopefully give you a heads up, look like to look for. Um, but we're going to start with basically random number generators, right? Having a good um, source of, of randomness is basically absolutely essential to cryptography. Is even if you do everything else right, if you got a bad source of randomness, then your crypto is going to be broken. Right. So, cryptographers demand basically what's called cryptographically secure, which means basically it's completely intractable to predict what the next uh, random number is going to be. Right. Java util random, which a lot of people use, um, is not uh, cryptographically secure. Java security secure random is. So, use it. Um, <coughs> 
the CSRMG also has to have an unpredictable seed. Um, and the seed entropy, in other words, the, the unpredictability part of it basically has to equal or exceed the internal state of the, of the random gen number generator. Okay. So when you're looking for uh, weaknesses in random number generation, what do you look for? Like one thing is look for cases of where like Java util random is used for anything uh, related to crypto. Like you can generate keys, or initialization vectors, nonces, you know, session IDs, stuff like that. Um, and then seeding it inadequately. A lot of times you see people like use Java secure random, but then they set the seed based on like the time of day or a process ID number or how much memory is left on the heap. So all those things tend to be predictable, right? So that means basically then subsequent things can be predicted. So the default implementation of um, it, uh, the Oracle Sun Secure Random uses SHA-1 PRMG, um, and it's basically, its constructor by default uses uh, WRANDOM, Random, which doesn't block. Um, but if you need a lot, then there's also a version that will use uh, dev random. Here's an example of what I'm talking about, though, right? So, SHA-1, uh, the state of a SHA-1 is basically 160 bits, right? So, you basically need at least 160 bits for your seed. Um, you can tell it to generate the seed at any point in time, but generally you should do it before you make it first call to next bytes or next long or next div or whatever it is you're using to get the actual random numbers. Right? So basically you say 160 and it's actually the seed size is actually specified in bytes, not bits, which is a little weird, but um, the way to do it. Um, and then the other thing is for JDK 8 and later if you have that you could consider, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, you have to use it cautiously. Um, using get instance strong instead of get instance, and what that does is it uses dev random instead of dev random. But the problem is if you like have a lot of these things running at boot time or something, right, it'll end up blocking. So, you know, I have one case where somebody was using a library we wrote and they had all set the security to like strong and it was taking like 20 minutes. Yeah. Kevin, is it a bad idea to take pseudo random and seed it with like the real time clock? For pseudo random? And you're chuckling, maybe it's a bad idea. Well, yeah, I mean, it depends on what you want to use it for. It's great if you want to roll dice or if you want to do yeah. Monte Carlo simulation, but not for cryptography, you no. Know? I mean, there, there's a couple exceptions, and the one, and I'll talk about the one here coming up. Okay. So, the other thing is basically secure hashing or message digest, right? So what do you look for there? Well, first of all, there's just like some algorithms that are absolutely flat out broke. Um, MD2, MD4, MD5. Um, those algorithms are all broke. Um, there's other things that people use for message digests, or for secure hash, rather, like CRC, cyclic redundancy checksums, that are not really um, collision-free enough. Uh, the other thing is like SHA-1, you probably all heard, a couple years ago, Google uh, found a break for it. Um, it's always had, not always, but like the last 10, 15 years or so, it's had like partial breaks. Um, so that should be avoided. It may be okay in certain cases. It's okay if you think with like pseudo random number generators or HMAX and stuff, but well, generally it shouldn't be avoided. You should like replace it with SHA 256 or SHA 512 or CACAC, which is SHA 3. Right. So the other thing is, now it just depends on what your threat model is, right? So when when you do a threat model, the big question is, are you insured, are you, are you concerned about like insider attackers, right? Attackers that have access to inside your network and stuff like that. And if you are, then you want to avoid when you're looking at hashes and comparing them. You want to avoid things that are time dependent, like string equals and array equals. So like string equals, for instance, you might be comparing two hashes that are base 64 encoded because it stops the first difference that it gets, right? That's a, basically a, a timing side channel attack that can be basically used to break into your system, right? Tim Morgan, who um, is an OWASP and, and gave a talk in 2015 here in Columbus, basically did some research and showed that um, it wasn't even statistically possible 
to, or at least he proved but beyond a reasonable doubt that it wasn't statistically possible across like a wide area network like the internet to basically um, be able to pick up the differences in timing for string equals or array equals. And basically, in a nutshell, it had to do with the jitter and the lag time right, on the network. Um, the other thing is calling message digest. Um, this is kind of unrelated to cryptography directly, but um, you know you can do a denial of service attack if you're given these things like undoubted input, right? So you want to make sure that somebody's basically has a bounce on it. Um, the other thing is that sometimes people misuse uh, a message digest as a message authentication code. Right? A message authentication code is actually a key hash, where you have a secret key that's generally shared out of bounds with another party. Right? And sometimes what they'll do is they say, well, I will just use this hash algorithm instead of an HMAC, which is the proper way in the uh, bottom. Right? Um, there's a thing called a length extension attack. So if they basically say hash the key concatenated with the message, that's susceptible to what's called a length extension attack. Um, if you're going to absolutely have to do that because, like I say, you don't have an HMAC algorithm available and you don't have time to actually implement it, which isn't really that hard, or you can't afford it time because it basically does a hash twice essentially. Um, then basically at least switch the order and put the message first and the key second. The other thing is basically um, misusing a hash to, for reasons other than basically um, ensuring data integrity. Like one example that I've seen is um, people will do it to mask data like in a log file or to use it as a key in a database. So it's, if you have like a case where you can enumerate through all or most of the input space, you want to avoid that type of thing. For instance, if you have like a SHA-256 of a social security number, right, I can easily compute all the possible social security number hashes, right, and then compare that to what was in the database or compare that to what's in the log and then basically figure out the identity of the person. So are you saying it's better to hash the entire log as opposed to the individual values? No, I'm saying basically if you were going to you absolutely have to do something like that, you should at least use a key hash so that the adversary doesn't have access to the key. Gotcha. All right, so one of the things that people ask me, because there's a lot of this latency code with MP5 in it, is it okay to use it still? Well, in certain cases it's okay, right? But basically know that on a laptop just like mine, and my laptop is about seven years old, right? That it takes basically five or six seconds to basically come up with a collision. All right, so if you want to use it for something like this, as a random number generator to um, select an initialization vector for CDC mode, then that's okay. If you want to use it as an HMAC, like HMAC MD5, that's okay. Um, three gentlemen here, I'm not going to try to pronounce most of their names, um, basically prove that the HMAC security doesn't rely on the underlying hash function being collision free, but only that it acts as a pseudo-random number, a pseudo-random function, which it does. Um, inappropriate uh, weaknesses for symmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption, if, I'm not sure everybody knows, but symmetric encryption is where you basically use the same key to encrypt and decrypt, right? So, um, inappropriate cipher modes like RC4, I mentioned, DES, things like that. Um, like, generally, most places now will require like some kind of a, um, adherence to like FIPS 142 stuff, so if you stick to that, you're going to kind of be safe. And just so you know, basically NIST dropped triple does last year. Um, anyways, the other thing is insufficient key size. This is something that came as a surprise to me. So like in, when you basically uh, create a key, you tell them what kind of um, algorithm you want it for, like, you know, does e, 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 this example, right? And the problem is that if you don't tell it what the key size is, for Java, it'll create a 112-bit key, unless you have the JCE unlimited strength zero distance policy files. Now, if you tell it that you want a 168-bit key, and you don't have those files installed, you'll get an exception from right? But if you don't tell it what size, it'll just give you back silently a 112-bit key. 
So that's kind of just a you know gotcha that you should be aware of. The other thing is that I got several slides with these things. Basically, ASCII generated keys that I see a lot. Um, basically, um, inappropriate use of cipher modes and um, assuming that confidentiality uh, implies data integrity. All right, so if we're talking about like non-extended ASCII, like the original ASCII that only had 127 different characters. Like here's an example of what you would see. And so one of the key, well, one of the keys, no pun intended, um, one of the main indicators though is that you're going to see something like key.getbytes go into the secret key spec. Right. Um, the problem with this is that like, if you're just using a printed plastic, which most people are going to stick to, right, you've got 97 different possible bit codes. If you pick a random key, a single byte has 256 bits. Right? So in order to get something like a 128-bit random key, you basically need a password that would be equivalent to about 42, 43 characters. Okay? But if you actually pass in a 42-bit key that size, you're going to get an invalid key length exception. <coughs> so instead, what you want to do is if you really want to use a password, then basically you either use a key stretching thing like scrypt, bcrypt, um, pbkdf, v2, something like that, or if you basically in Java they already have a thing called password-based encryption, which basically does the key stretching for you and then takes the result of the key and does the encryption. All right, question. What's the default cipher mode of this? Everybody knows this one now. ECB. ECB, right. All right, so um, ECB basically is, is like a raw application of the cipher, and it's broken. We have basically, when we talk about cipher modes, we have two essential modes. We have ECB and CBC, which are block modes that operate on a block of data at a time. Typically, it's 16. Um, bytes at a time for modern ciphers and eight bytes at a time for old ciphers like DES and Blowfish. Um, and everything else basically is a streaming mode. All the modes require an initialization vector except for ECB, which is one of the reasons why people use it, because it's easy. Right? Um, however, there's a key here, one of the main points. It's like, if you don't take anything else out of this, just remember this one point. Um, that if you're ever using a streaming mode, you cannot ever use the same key and ID pair to encrypt two different messages. Because if you do, and your adversary is, has access to saving all the ciphertexts that they see, then you're screwed. And I'll show you an example of that. But the other thing is, too, streaming modes don't require patch because they work on a bit at a time. All right, so. Inappropriate use of cipher modes. ECB is a raw application, I mentioned that. Um, the, it gets used a lot because it's basically the first and sometimes the only example that you see in textbooks. Um, it's the easiest to implement. You don't have like, what is this IE thing and what do I do with it? And, you know, stuff like that. But the problem is that the same plain text blocks basically always encrypt to the same cipher text. Right? So that means a block replay attack is possible. Well, this is the first example that I had was from ECB, ECB, and this is where the same uh, bytes basically, you know, taking this image, you can see the pattern clearly with the ECB mode, and any other mode basically looks like random noise, which is what we want it to look like. Right? Um, so block replay attacks I mentioned, right? Well, basically a block replay attack is one where somebody can take the ciphertext blocks and rearrange them. And anyway, they can delete blocks, they can rearrange them, and everything would be cool when you try to, you know, decrypt it. You won't get any kind of error when you actually try to decrypt it. They can and probably will change the semantic meaning of the message, of the plain text message at the other end, but the decryption will work. So consider the following example here that is from Bruce Schneier, and actually earlier from that goes back to 78. Um, so we have basically this thing that moves money between banks. And we have like ascending and receiving, um, let's say, routing numbers, right, that are one and a half um, uh, block, cipher blocks. And then the recipient's name is allocated to six blocks, and the recipient's account number, two blocks, and a, and a deposit number, or, I'm sorry, an amount for the deposit. 
recipient being here the who we're depositing it for. Right. So what I'm talking about is you see here, right, this pretty much. Right, so you see basically these things are completely independent. One of the advantages of ECD mode is basically because they are completely independent, it's good for random, you know, seeking of random files that are encrypted. You can seek to random blocks and encrypt the blocks that you need and stuff. Um, and you can also do it in parallel, right? So that's the other reason why it gets used a lot, because there's a lot of speed up possible. Um, but the problem is that I can take, like, say, ciphertext block, the first one, and switch it with the third one, and nobody will notice when they try to decrypt it. Because it's still going to, the decryption will still work. Right? So let's suppose that Mallory is a man in the middle Asian, and she's listening to the communication <coughs> between the bank of Alice and the bank of Bob. Right? And Mallory goes in and she sets up accounts in both banks, puts some seed money in, in the bank of Alice, transfers the fixed amount to her account, and records the transactions. Like I said, she's a man in the middle, an active attacker. And she repeats it later, she looks for the identical box and then like isolates her transaction in the communication channel. Right? Now she can basically, at will, insert those blocks in the communication channel at any time, basically transfer money that she doesn't have, and then basically, you know, before the bank's accounts are reconciled, she just skipped town. Right? She could also just in, inject her encrypted uh, name and account. Um, by substituting it just for the depositor's stuff, the recipient's part. Um, but then if she had to do that, she'd have to wait for transactions to the bank of Bob or whatever. So. And the other thing is this cannot be like just defeated simply by repenting a date and timestamp because, like I said, she can also just, you know, re um, replace the recipient's name and account number. Um, she can also it, it can be defeated if basically you use a secure key hash to over the entire message, right? Or using some other kind of cipher mode like CBC or whatever. But you can't do it with an unkeyed hash, like let's say if you just add a SHA-1 to the end, because Mallory can compute the SHA-1 the same way and just add it back in. All right, so if people are using ECB, what do you look for? Well, first of all, you look for um, like Cypher, in Java you look for Cypher.get instance and AES. And by the way, um, it is default mode here, but in .NET, CBC is the default mode, so it's much safer, uh, seven defaults. Um, the other thing is, you will notice evidence of no IV being used. You can tell that by the length of the resolving encryption, because usually, not always, but you have to get the IV there somewhere. The IV doesn't have to be protected, it doesn't have to be uh, secret. So usually it's prepended to the raw ciphertext. So because of that, for any given encryption that uses an IV, it's going to be longer. Um, the other thing is you're going to see calls in Java code either IV frame respect or cipher get IV. So you look for those. Right. So is it ever okay to use? Well, yeah, it's kind of complicated. Um, if you um, basically. I would say the, the short end is don't do it, but if you have to, um, those are all the, the nitty gritty details. I don't want to go into this because I'd like to get through more slides, but you know, if you want to look it up. Um, if it seems okay though, ask yourself these questions, right? And if you can answer yes to all the questions, then block replay attack is probably possible. So is it possible? Um, uh, or multiple blocks of ciphertext encrypted. That's almost always the case, right? Um, are there multiple ciphertext blocks exposed to an adversary? And again, this depends on your threat model. You may not consider because this is like something that's in an internal database that your adversary is an insider. This depends, right? And the other cases will block ordering, block reordering ever fail to be detected in those cases. And if you're not sure, then basically assume that a block replay is possible. Right. So the other thing besides block mode is streaming modes. Right. Stream ciphers and block ciphers um, are, there's stream ciphers like RC4 or Salsa20 from Dan Bernstein or is it, uh, 8, 5, slash 1 and slash 2, I think it's used with GSM phones in Europe. Um, basically, but um, they all work the same way. What they do is they generate a cipher bit bit stream 
that then they take and they XOR the plain text data, right? So um, what you're doing here essentially at the end is if you look at that last line there, if you have this encryption function that takes a key and ID and a message, what it is is the message XORed with this cipher bitstream that's based only on the key and the ID. And so from this, I'm going to show you why you can't, with two different messages, repeat the same uh, key and ID, right? So let's see what happens when basically encrypting your messages is A and B. Right? So everybody understands the encryption stuff. I mean, the, the XOR operation, hopefully. How many of you are like devs? There's a couple of you. Okay. So I know the security people understand what XORs are. So, um, yeah. so anyways, basically, an adversary inter intercepts both of those ciphertexts. They can just compute the XOR of them. And what pops out is basically A, X, or B, which is just the uh, XOR. Essentially, what that gives you is sort of the differences between the texts, right? And then you can basically use frequency analysis to figure out what those are. Um, and on, you know, a modest computer can crack that for a modest like message in a couple of minutes. Um, it's even easier if there's like patterns to the data that you know. Like for instance, I know these data is all credit card numbers, or I know them. They're all some kind of a message like an a email header or something like that, right? So they have some kind of format to them. Then you can use that information to make sure that you made the right guesses in, in the frequency analysis. So the more ciphertexts that you have, the better. Um, if you have ones that are um, like different sizes, like say A is shorter than B, then basically you're going to XOR the things together. You're only going to get up to the shortest message. The rest of the part won't be uh, discernible. Uh, and here's a great example uh, from Rick Smith. Basically, what he's done is um, he's taken this and put it in pictures, kind of like the tux thing that we saw, right? So the, the plus with the circle is an XOR operation. So he has an image that says send cache and an encryption key. And you can look down here at the, the bottom of the send cache, you know, just to see that they're actually different. That's kind of like a superimposed close-up of the left-hand corner there, right? So basically, you take that send cache with an encrypted key, and you get the, send, the encrypted version of send cache encrypted, right? And to recover it, basically, you take the encrypted key and next word again. All good. Now, so that's that happens. Let's try taking two different things here, right? So, and you got to trust me, because I'm pretty sure I don't want to really go through all the little individual bots in the encryption key that is the same key. So just trust me on that. But basically, you get an encrypted smiley and an encrypted uh, send cache, and then we're going to export those two together, and that's what we get. Anybody see a problem there? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's why you don't do this. <laughs> And it gets worse, right? Because if Mallory happens, it, you know, basically uh, know, like I know that this person has purchased this for a thousand dollars, and because I was the one selling it to them, maybe, right? And they're going to send me a uh, an encrypted message that says I buy this for a thousand dollars, right? But I can change it to make it like say ninety five dollars, ninety five hundred dollars, or whatever just by adding that part that's in red to the message stream, and then comes out basically as that blast thing. Um, so basically you actually can tamper with the data that way. This is a Wikipedia article on, on stream cipher attacks. Got a good example of this. In fact, I think that may where this came from. Okay, let's take a little detour here. Authenticated encryption. I mentioned at the beginning that one of the big failings of SAC overflow is they don't really distinguish between integrity versus confidentiality. Traditional encryption supports confidentiality, in other words, it provides secrecy, right? But it doesn't, by default, do anything to provide data, ensure data integrity to say that this ciphertext actually came from this person, right? So we want that. We want to know that that message that ciphertext that was sent has not been tampered with and routed somehow. Now, there's a couple ways to do that with traditional encryption. One is basically you use an encrypt of Mac, which takes, you, you know, encrypt, then you take the Mac, like a HMAC SHA-1 or something, and you apply that over like the ID and the ciphertext and append the Mac to the end. Um, 
there's also an encrypt and Mac that you encrypt a plain text and basically append a Mac in the plain text. And then there's also a Mac then encrypt, which you take a Mac as a plain text and encrypt them both together. Right? And then the decryption operation, the verification of the authenticity happens just in reverse order. Right? It turns out that um, Sean Bonaday basically discovered that encrypt then Mac is actually the only secure way to do it. And originally, um, uh, encrypt and Mac, I think it is, is what SSL uses. Um, and IPsec originally used it, and IPsec changed it to encrypt then Mac. Um, but ETM now is built into some cipher modes, CCM and GCM, which are not missed through, so you could probably use those, and they're actually in Java 8, maybe Java 7 even. So no, it's encrypt then Mac is the good one. Pardon? It said encrypt then Mac was the good one. Encrypt then Mac, yeah. Excellent. Then you said the other one was missed approved too? Pardon? Then you said another one was missed approved? No, or yeah. No? GC, okay, there's cipher modes that are built on the ETM approach. They're, they're like, but they're like one pass, the, especially the EAX one. But the EAX used to be patented. I don't know if the patent has expired. Um, But yeah, CCM and GCM are, are missed approved. I don't think EAX is yet. It might, probably will be if, if the patent is fired. But, um, right. So there's a thing called a Horton principle that Schneier and David Wagner and other cryptographers came up with. Um, and it's relevant to basically figure out what data you want to include in the Mac, right? So normally, like I said in the previous slide there, that basically when you want to Mac something, like for the encrypt then Mac thing, that you basically will Mac the ID in the ciphertext. But what if you pass in a message, for instance, that says, here's the cipher mode, or here's the actual cipher, like, you know, the cipher transform, like ADS slash CPC slash PKCS5 padding or whatever. What if I include that as a message so that the recipient then knows how to decrypt it, but I'm going to pass that in, right? Well, part of the problem is that you better Mac that. That's what he's saying here. Right. So you don't basically, you avoid any sending any unauthenticated data. You don't send it or rely on it, or you have to include it in the Mac. And so basically we're talking about mapping the metadata. All right, so when you don't have an encrypted authentication possible, and this is, I mean, I think it was either Java 7 or Java 8 where they actually added the AE modes um, to Java. Um, I know like in Java 6 is definitely not there because that was what I wrote ESAP with. Um, but basically the, the problem is that um, to use this correctly you have to have a random key and a random ID with the correct padding. You have to HMAC over the correct data. Um, the common mistakes that you see are people basically using a fixed ID or a predictable ID um, a lot of times they use a fixed ID because they don't realize that the visualization factor doesn't really mean that you have secret, right? And they're afraid to send it with the cipher text. And otherwise, like, what am I going to do? Encrypt the ID? No, I can't do that. So they just basically pick one fixed one. Um, yeah. Very afraid. Uh, so, uh, do you have any examples from a programming perspective? Why would why would you use the this authenticated type of encryption. So like encryption of rest is just straight AES, right? Just that's how it works. Well, so you heard of work for padding attacks? What was that? You ever heard of a I'm sorry, padding work will attack? Like a data for data at rest? Or anything? Well it can be with data at rest too. Anybody Any depends on what the adversary is, right? And yeah. it goes back again. One as a security person, I start every every question with what is your threat model? Right? Who's your adversaries? What are your threat sources? If you consider insiders like a database administrator as a possible threat source, right, then yeah, you probably want to use authenticated encryption because you. you want to make sure that they can't tamper with that data. If I can go in and encrypt data and replace this encrypted you know, credit card number with a different one, now it gets charged to a different person. But you don't want to allow that, right? Another thing that's handy about it, it's not, it doesn't protect you against an attack, but 
if you're using something like password-based encryption, it makes it really easy to tell if the key is correct. Um, okay. Because the HMAC will fail, whereas decrypt always works. It's just that you'll get gibberish out of it. Okay. Um, so why is it needed? Well, it's, 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 it's the ciphertext of authenticity can be in doubt when you need it. I, I basically just mentioned this slide. Um, so don't assume basically that you know automatically because it's encrypted, somebody can't mess with the data. Like the simplest thing is like I can encrypt some data as an adversary. I see the encrypted data and I replace my encrypted data with your encrypted data. Right? That's the simplest attack. Um, if and, and the other thing is sometimes people will take like you know does everybody know what parameter tampering is? Like an attack on the web where somebody can basically just change the parameters and it doesn't get detected and like say I can change my account to your account and now I get access to your account because it's a post parameter or something or a hidden parameter that they can change. Mm -hmm. Well, so sometimes people to try to prevent that will use encryption, right? And really what they're saying is I don't care the secret because I know the person has entered their own account number, right? I just want to make sure they don't change it, so I'm going to encrypt it. Well, that won't necessarily work. If that's really all you need, if all you need is actually um, data integrity, authenticity, then you're better off just using a flat out, using an HMAC, because it is much, much faster than doing encryption. Okay. How are we doing on time here? It's about 15. All right. Um, so chosen plain text text is basically, okay, an asymmetric cipher is when you have two keys, a public key and a private key, right? Um, just for those of you who are here, um, Craig touched on that a little bit, right? The public key is always assumed to be known. So what that means is that there's always an, uh, a potential attack, whether it's successful or not is another thing, but there's certainly a potential vulnerability here that a chosen plain text attack can always be done on an asymmetric crypto system because if you know what the public key is, which is assumed, right, because it's public, then basically the adversary can basically encrypt with that public key and observe the output, which is the ciphertext. So now we have a ciphertext a chosen plain ciphertext attack is I can basically choose the ciphertext that I want and encrypt it and, and look at patterns and stuff like that. Right. So why is that a problem? Well, normally it's not because we're encrypting highly unpredictable plain text that's too large to be enumerated. Right. Typically what we use asymmetric encryption for is to encrypt symmetric accession keys or cryptographic hash values or something like that. Right. It does become a problem when the plain text is highly regular or short enough to enumerate all possible values, which leads to this real-world example, which I can't tell you who it was, but um, a real-world bad example. Um, all right, so an application basically used get instance or cipher dot get instance RSA, right? Um, and then basically what they were doing is they were encrypting uh, encrypting credit card numbers and storing them in their database. Now, first of all. Using uh, RSA for that is just kind of stupid because it's like by a thousand times slower than AES. But aside from that, the problem with it is that basically, um, a, like an adversary who's like a database or a developer or somebody who has access to the database could basically enumerate and encrypt all the possible credit card numbers and pair them. Well, why could they do that? Well, it turns out that get instance RSA basically uses the default cipher mode, or I'm sorry, the default padding mode of PKCS1 version 1.5. So what that means is that every time you encrypt data with RSA, it basically gives you the exact same ciphertext back for the same plain text, right? So you see where I'm going with this, right? You basically just encrypt them all, you make a table of here's the clear text uh, credit card number, here's the ciphertext credit card number, and I go into the database and Look at those rows and get the rest of the identity, and we're good. Right. So, hey, made it to actually some of the miscellaneous topics. <laughs> All right, so, rekeying and frequency. Well, 
PCI, right, for payment card industry for credit cards. Um, it says you must change your crypto keys at least yearly, but is that enough? All right, so one of the things is originally uh, NIST in their special publication, this is the one that like specifically talks about uh, DES and triple DES, basically said that you should rekey every two to 30 second or whatever um, times uh, 64 byte bits rather, of plain text. 64 bits turns out it's the uh, block size, right? So in general, it's basically two to the n over two times the type of block size in bits. Um, however, it turned out that they just revised that last year, and now they're recommending that basically you should rekey every eight gigabytes, right? Which is also one of the reasons why they basically said, okay, we're deprecating triple this. <laughs> Because what, what they found out, somebody did a study, right, and they found out that there was like in 39% of the encryptions, there's like a, a, an attack called meat in the middle. So, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, they, uh, when you say rekey every eight gigabytes, you mean every eight gigabytes that you encrypted with that, every with that key? Eight, no, yeah, every eight gigabytes of plain text that you encrypted with that key, you should take, change the key. Okay. Which is a lot different than basically PCI saying you change your cyber duration. Yeah, because I mean, it might, you know, it, it, it's sort of like the key where it's out of So. And there's actually a, um, I don't remember this, but there's a thing called a Sweet 32. Uh, it was an attack on TLS that basically used the legacy 32 bit ciphers, like the triple does ciphers. Um, and Matthew Green, the cryptographer posted on that, but that was actually an example of this mean in the middle attack that we're talking about here. Mean in the middle attacks kind of like works like the way the birthday paradox does, if you're familiar with the birthday paradox. All right, so key management. Where do you store your keys? Well, ideally you want to put them in a hardware security man, uh, man module or a trusted platform module. Um, if you hard code them in your source code, or put them in a properties file, well, you need to be really, really careful with that because generally those situations, like especially in source code, like they're gonna go on a subversion control system, right? I found out, and I do not have hard, hard coded keys, but I found out like in a previous company that I worked with, right, where we had eight developers in my team, and we were supposed to be the only ones that had access to it, but then there were these system administrators and the version control uh, repo people and stuff like that. And after I added up all the people that had access to it, it was 123 people, right? So it's probably not that much different where you work. Um, you know, it's gonna be a lot of people have access to stuff that they shouldn't have access to. Or, you know, what do you do? Like you change your key every time basically an employer leaves, you know, that had access to it. So the other thing is, um, you might want to put it in a config file and log it down and have that config file controlled by the ops group and not and, and make it unavailable to everybody else. So hopefully the ops team that has access to that particular server is a lot smaller than whoever has access to your code repository. Right? Now you might be complaining, well, that means that they have to encrypt all the data. Well, write them a script to run. <laughs> you know, what should I say? You're gonna do you know. For .NET, um, there's a thing called Data Protection API, which basically uses your credentials to encrypt. It basically forms a, a encryption key out of your credentials, um, and then it basically encrypts with that. Or if you're like using WebLogic, there's a WebLogic encryption services. And, and lastly, not so much, but the Java Key Store is always a possibility. But if you're doing things like um, like putting it in a config file and stuff like that, you should never put the encryption key in the same file with the data that's being encrypted. That's generally not a good thing. Because, you know, somebody might just say, hey, if I can only switch this entire file and put my own connection string in there for the database, I'll get you to send the stuff to my database. Speaking of databases, um, <laughs> All right, so there's three ways to basically encrypt data for a database, right? One is basically the database engine does it itself using something like uh, called TDE, Transparent Data Encryption. Um, both Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server support this. Um, the other way is basically like a proxy. Uh, CryptDB is the only one that I know of, or you can do it in the application code. 
from from the uh, application perspective, TDE is basically simple. It is almost completed, but not completely, but it's 90% transparent, right, to the application. Um, and it probably, I don't know if we're 100%, I have asked the PCI auditors and haven't responded yet. Um, it probably says on the letter of the law for PCI says, yes, I have, I'm using encryption for my database, right? Um, but it's just a really bad solution, right? Here's what, basically, a 30,000 foot view of how it works, right? So, so TDE basically can work at either the column, the table, or the table space level. And it has two, typically, um, cipher suites available, one with AES and one with triple dose. And key management basically is done with two different keys. One is a master key, and the other one is basically, the master key basically is like a key encryption key. It encrypts the individual keys that are used for the table and we'll call them a table space, right? Usually, CBC mode is used, but it only uses a single ID for all the encryptions for that same key. And the reason for that is because you want the encryption to be deterministic, because if you didn't, then indexing is not going to work, right? Now, if you don't need that particular, like, row or that particular column to be indexed, then it's not a problem, right? But if, like, you weren't going to um, encrypt uh, primary account numbers on, on a credit card, right, you probably want to be able to search those. So maybe, you know, if, if that's absolutely needed, you can't basically, you have to use the same IV. Um, they do allow you to basically do non-deterministic encryption with a thing called a salt. Basically, what that says is user can IV. Right. So why does this fail? Well, the problem is that if that application has a database table or a column open, and any other application has access to that same data, uh, table or column, basically has access to that data, right? Because they, the, once it's open and it's encrypted, right, that other application doesn't need to provide the master key to open it, right? It's already open, so that's one problem, right? Now, if you potentially partitioning your database so that you have views and might say, well, you know, only the people that are legitimately supposed to see this encrypted data can see this encrypted data, and that's maybe not an issue. The other thing is, depending on how backups are done, backups may end up encrypting or may up, may up, may end up dumping the table as plain text, right? Um, so usually the data that we're encrypting in the database is like less than 20 bytes and has a particular format and limited possibilities, okay? And patterns can basically allow the enumeration of values, like I talked about already with encrypting you know, credit card numbers and stuff with the RSA case. I mean, the same thing would be done if you have a fixed IV and whatever, right? So um, those are the problems with that. Um, you want to talk, well, should I stop them for questions or do you want me to keep on going? Or is everybody asleep? I wanted to thank you for saying clear text instead of plain text. All right. I butt heads with the cryptographers on my team because I want to say clear text because if they say plain text, they mean plain text one word and, and I'll hear plain text two words, which is a communications term. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, thank yeah. You. All right, so all right. SSL sockets. Um, one of the things is if you're doing like raw level socket SSL TLS stuff um, and you're creating this uh, SSL socket factory, it does not like default to um, either hosting verification or certificate pinning. And that means basically that man, the middle attacks are possible. Right? So if you don't do hosting verification, right, um, if you basically get a certificate back from the server, but you're not authenticating that server, right? So I'm supposed to go to foo.bar.com and uh, really going to baz.bar.com and you're getting a certificate back and it's like it's a valid certificate and everything else, so you just assume that you're making the right connection, but I mean, hey, somebody could hijack your DNS or they could do like our cache poisoning or stuff like that, right? So that's one problem with that. Um, the way you correct that is basically you can subclass the SSL socket or you can uh, create an SSL context, which is the easiest way that basically um, uses and then write an explicit um, thing to do hosting verification. Um, 
Okay, so specifying, you notice this if we're paying attention, right? When I was like doing the thing with the, the seating of the Shaw one, that I had a thing there in the second argument that said Bouncy Castle. There's a reason for that. That's really kind of the only way that you basically can get secure. Um, they, there's two ways to basically do uh, security providers, right? One, you can add them statically to those files, or you can add them dynamically via the security ad provider and insert provider, right? So let's look at the possibilities here. Right? What could possibly go wrong with this? I'm adding a bouncy castle provider. Well, by default, that thing, add provider, adds it at the end of the list, right? So even if I'm like saying, give me an ADS implementation, it's going to get the first one available, which is going to be the one from Slum. So we don't want that. All right, what if I tell it to insert it at the first position? That's equivalent to this. Okay, looks fine. However, what could possibly go wrong? Well, let's consider basically it's somebody using log for j. You know, it's a rogue copy that somebody grabbed from a mirror. And they didn't, you know, I mean, maybe they validated the SHA-1, you know, thing, but somebody changed on that. They put up a rogue mirror, they compromised that mirror, and they altered the SHA-1 even, right? So you don't know you have a compromised log for j guard. And somebody basically, you know, in the method, uh, logger .get logger basically inserts a shim of the provider, basically, you know, they stick in my evil provider that basically is going to take an SSL connection out to their server, or maybe like logs in a bunch of keys and stuff in a temp file somewhere, and then periodically launches out a thing to exfiltrate the data, right? So how do we address this? Well, the best way to do it is basically do it when you create the actual instance. Or the other alternative is, and I'm maybe people laugh, right? The office security team can provide this if you use it, but most people don't. So, what do you look for when you're trying to find these things? Well, you look for, like, you know, Java security or security.app provider or insert provider without the use of a Java security manager. So, and then wrapping up your um, additional references. Um, this is still a work in progress. It's been a work in progress for four years. I have my chapter pretty much done, so I'm waiting on everybody else. So don't wait. <laughs> um, uh, but there's that chapter that has some things. And if you have questions, you can do this or DM me or whatever. Any questions now? Or? Did we ever, in in reality, see uh, attacker initiated versus developer shooting themselves in the foot? Uh, randomness depletion kind of attacks uh, or somebody has used a blocking call. Or the only time that we've seen things like that have been like from nation states um, because that's like sometimes they will, they will attack like routers and stuff like that um, and sometimes in some, certain cases like a certain three letter agency and our government basically has forced places like uh, Cisco to put in back doors and stuff like that but um, you know, normally we don't see attacks on cryptography because they're harder to exploit than just like, oh, I have a SQL injection here, I can just grab the whole database, you know, or whatever, so, yeah. Uh, you had mentioned Bouncy, Cats, Bouncy Castle as a uh, security provider. Do you have any other recommendations? Uh, I know I've personally used like I, 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 AIK. Yeah, um, I used that before. I mean, it doesn't seem to be kept up, up to date as much as Gossip Castle, but um, uh, RSA's got one. Uh, it's called JSafe or something. Um, and then IBM has one. And then IBM and I think the RSA one are FIPS approved. So if, you're, if you need something like that. Anyone else? Yeah. You talked about uh, known, known plain text attacks. Um, I was wondering how, how long would it take to, to use a, a plain text attack to break to, to come up and calculate the privacy for, you know, uh, an SSL certificate? Is that just not fast? But, um, like, what, what well, yeah, but it's like, computational yeah, time? Yeah, it's like, yeah. Well, this is one of the reasons why they started going from like um, 
Sure. You know, the length of the keys was 1024. Well, originally, it was like when I started in the industry, it was like 512. Right, and then I went to 24, I was yeah, I think 2048. 2048, yeah. 4096. Right, yeah. So, I mean, and but the like, problem so is that. So, it's been like 2048, and they're using SHA 256. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's some, um, if you do the secure, if you do the validation of the certificate correctly, when you're making an SSL connection, there's not too much of a chance unless they are really still using a short key. I mean, it's not within the realm of possibility. I mean, maybe somebody like if NSA wanted to expend all their resources on nothing but that, they might be able to do it, but they don't want to do that. I mean, it's like they have so many other ways. I mean, you look at all like the hardware, you know, things like the Spectre and the Meltdown and stuff like that. I mean, we're just completely defenseless, man. So it's like, it's not crypto that's not going to save us. I mean, that's not really the weak link of the chain. Anybody else? Okay, class dismissed. No. <laughs>